Hello. Good evening, everyone. Sorry I'm a bit late today. Went for a little bit of a walk because I haven't been able to escape the house because of smoke all weekend. It's been horrible. But there was a pause today, just a little bit right now, so I ran out while I could. All right, so here's the painting that I've got. Let's give you an overview of it. That's the full thing so far. I've been working on it since the last week. Some of you were around when I was working on a couple of the little hummingbirds over here. I think I did this little hummingbird last Monday. And so in the interim, I've gotten all this. It's not yet done. Still have several hours left to do on that whole half of her mantle, as well as the hands over here. Oh, and I've been practicing hands all week. Here's a little notebook. I decided I was going to do hands for the next 30 days. So I've gotten like five days of hands so far. Here's what I've gotten. Because you can never draw enough hands. <laughs> they are always weird and hard, <laughs> no matter how many times you draw them. <laughs> So this is what I have been doing. I think this is like five days worth of hands now. Been doing pencil and ink as well as some gouache. This is my daughter's little 10 year old hands. What's funny is that you can actually tell the difference between a five year old hands and my gnarly 44 year old hands. Sorry, did I say five at 10 year old hands? 10 year old's hands. They're kind of rounded and more dimpled. <laughs> And those are my hands. <laughs> that's, that's how much I've gotten so far. So this is, this is like five days worth of hands. Most of the time in my paintings, I have just little teeny tiny hands because I am mostly zoomed way out on my figures. And so very rarely do I do paintings large enough like this where I'm going to be working on hands at a close enough view where I need to make sure that I know what I'm doing with them. So I think I'm going to work on some more of the feathers on her mantle here today. And as always, if you have random questions about anything doesn't have to be related to this painting that I'm working on. I'm happy to answer them. And I try to look up at my chat log here every once in a while to see what people are saying. But forgive me if I miss things because I'm just doing this on my own. BM with roses. I have your tarot deck and I love it. Well, thank you very much. I'm glad you enjoy the deck. Every once in a while, I think about doing another deck, <laughs> but I haven't yet gotten around to that. <laughs> another 78 cards is a big investment. I've, I've thought about it because I kind of want to do one more nature themed, you know, like with all the, the insects and the birds and, and things that I like to paint these days. Shadowscapes is very, it, it has a, a strong nature element, but it's, it's also very much fantasy. And I don't think I would ever walk away from fantasy entirely. I mean, look at this piece here. <laughs> but I, I do, I think it would be fun to do a deck that had a more close um, nature element than the Shadowscapes does. How is the air quality here today, Marla asks? It sucks. <laughs> it's been sucking all week, weekend. Uh, we had some good days last Thursday and Friday where I almost was ready. I was, I was actually looking at my air purifier and I just bought this giant one. It's like three feet tall. And 
I was thinking, okay, where am I going to store this thing now that I don't need it any longer for this fire? And I was actually contemplating places to store it away. But that was wishful thinking because it is still going strong. Um, I think the fires, I haven't checked today, but last I looked yesterday, I think the most, one of the three fires is 35% contained and the other two were about 25%. So really that means they're making progress, but it's, it's going to be like this for a little while still for another couple weeks is my guess. We have, we have good days and bad because it depends on the wind. And in general, the evenings are a little bit better because I think the, the ocean causes like cooling or moisture in the air and that kind of settles some of the smog a bit. I'm going to zoom in more so that you can see more clearly what's going on. And I'm just doing a lot of dry brush on these feathers. And there's there's some variation of the color because I want to have them echo the, the sort of peacock colors that I had going with the hummingbirds, just on, on a much larger scale. But I'm starting by shading each of these little feathers like this. <laughs> and, and I alternate this with washes of color as well as varying the colors that I'm using in these strokes. Am I going to do another run of the Shadowscapes Trail Major book Julia for long is asking? I am not sure. I have to check with what the status of that is with my publisher Llewellyn because they they took on the open edition of it that I uh, that was released as a soft cover these past couple of years and so I have to I have to see what the status of that contract is if I'm allowed to redo it if they are no longer going to be printing it because they they did an edition they did a soft cover edition that I think has now sold out Marla says, I would love to see an update on my Shadowscapes books with my updated palette and latest painting subject. Do you mean the, the Dreamscapes books, Marla? The Shadowscapes is the tarot. Dreamscapes was the, the technique books. Is that what you are referring to instead? Sharon Gray Yard says Wallbridge is up to 50% containment. That's good to hear. Uh, is that another name for one of the ones near me in the Bay Area? That doesn't sound familiar. I think that the three that I'm familiar with are right now, there's one up in Napa, and then there's one down in Big Basin, south of San Jose, and, and then one south of San Mateo. So fortunately, Oakland is safe from all of these fires, but it's it's just the the topography of California means that you get lots of smoke when this happens. It's crazy when you look at the aerial maps right now of California and you see where the smoke is collected. It's just so it, it's a it's clear outline of um, Central Valley and all the lowlands surrounded by mountains this is exactly where the smoke has all collected in this big ugly pool. What eraser do I use on watercolor paper? Asks Randy. The one I have acts like wax and resists the paint. 
I like to use a, let's see, I have two erasers. I use a Faber Castell, so this is an unopened one, but it's the same thing. It's an unopened and white one, but essentially it's the same thing. I like the dust free because it means that I don't have a ton of, I mean, there's a little bit of erasure dust, but there's not crazy amounts like you get with most erasers. And then I also use my trusty kneaded eraser, which is extremely useful for just picking up small amounts of the, like, like if I don't want to erase something entirely, sometimes I just, I'll just squish it against my page like that, you know, and it'll, it'll pick up some of the pencil. I mean, it's not going to do it right now because I've got a layer of um, water. So what I do is I, I do my sketch and then I layer, I just do, a, I just do a swipe of my brush across the whole painting before I start actually painting with a wet brush. And that helps to sort of settle the graphite into the paper a little bit and makes it a little bit less likely to rub off as I'm doing, as I'm painting. Um, and it, it, it doesn't, it, it doesn't fix it completely. It's not like fixative, but it does make it so that it's less likely if I, you know, if I'm just like rubbing my hand across the surface as I paint, it's less likely to just get picked up by my hand. And, and so I don't end up with smudged blurry pencil drawing, but it, it can still be erased. You just have to work a little harder once you have done that. A layer of water that is. So yeah, I do I do that and I let it dry and then I start to paint. And he says I can't seem to erase cleanly with kneaded. Yeah, it it doesn't really I don't use the kneaded eraser for erasing cleanly. I use it for erasing partially. Uh, in fact, I, I use it to just lighten my sketch, but not erase it entirely. Because I want, I want the sketch to be lighter so that by the time I finish painting, you don't see any sketch lines at all, is the goal. And I, I don't even have to erase when I'm done. The, the sketch is just no longer visible. So I don't recommend kneaded eraser for the purpose of, of getting a clean lift of your pencil line. I, I recommend it for other purposes, like lightening your sketch in an even way without smearing, because what you can do and I've talked about this before too. Let me find my needed eraser again. Where did I stick it? I just had it. <laughs> now it's gone. There it is. Okay. So what you can do is you can just take a small piece of it and then have it, you know, shape it as a log. And then you just kind of roll it like this across your, your pencil sketch. And depending on how hard you press, it will lift up more or less of your pencil lines. So that's another thing I like to use it for. But it doesn't, it, by doing that, because you're just kind of rolling it and it's just sort of picking up, you know, like a lint roller, <laughs> like a lint roller would pick up lint from a sweater. It's not smearing things the way it, it would if you use a regular eraser. It's just sort of sticking to and lifting up the graphite in a layer. says, I think you could follow the same outlines unless that would present a publishing conflict. So I'm assuming that you're referring to the Dreamscapes technique books. So um, 
Yeah, I probably, I probably could, although I would probably want to redo my content just because I would get bored of it <laughs> and editing something that was completely the same, especially since I think I wrote those books, oh, I think probably the first Dreamscapes happened in 2007. So it's been like 14 years since I wrote that first book. And so I think I would like to address the subjects again if I were to do that in, in a renewed way. Forever 13 says, is it difficult to publish an art book? What is it like working on publishing one? So there's two kinds of publishing avenues. There is the self-publish route and there is the traditional publishing route. And I have always gone with, I've, I've done both because I think that there is a place for traditional publishing and there's a place for self-publishing. And I think that it reaches two separate audiences. So, and, and they have different challenges to deal with each of them because for traditional publishing what that means is you're going to have to get the attention of a publisher first. You're going to have to sell your idea to someone and make them believe in it so that they will fund and back it and put this thing out and take the risk of putting it out on the market and so that, that involves either having enough pull of your own that, that you can approach a publisher uh, and they will believe that you can sell this thing or that they can sell this thing for you based on you know, what you've done, your resume, your art portfolio, or else coming to them with such an amazing idea that they go, wow, you you have something here and we want to be the ones to put it out in the world. So, so that's the tricky part with getting something published traditional style. And the, the tricky part about doing it on your own then is that you are your own investor. And so you have to be able to either have the funds for the publishing endeavor because it's not cheap to get a book printed as well as getting it out there and, and into people's hands. Uh, so you either have to have that capital or else you have to have a Kickstarter or, or Indiegogo plan to accomplish that. So I've done, I've done both over the years and Oh, as I said, there's, I feel like there's different market for each of these. You know, the, the self-published route is much more for specialty items that are more for my direct fan base, for, for people who are supporting my art because I am an element of it. Because, you know, they, they, they know me from Instagram or they... They've followed my art for a while and they are supporting me as an artist versus the publishing route, which I, I feel like there is overlap with that, of course. There are people who see the thing and they, they buy it because they know who I am as an artist, but there are also a lot of people in a traditional publishing route who are not familiar with artists as, as individual people, really, you know? <laughs> <laughs> we're more a commodity and the publisher is is selling that that commodity uh, packaged in whatever it is you know as a calendar as a book or whatever and and so it is less important than to have a very specialty item but more uh, to have something that they think can reach a mass audience so when I consider a project for uh, what kind of publishing avenue I want to do for it, these are the things that I think about. I think about 
is it something that is that I want to make into some something really special you know like like the undying tales that I'm I'm doing right now the newest book that I'm releasing in a month and taking pre-orders on right now but it it's it's definitely much more of a special thing especially because I, I wanted to have it as a have a special edition of it which was a limited edition that I you know, I sketch something in each one for people, so it, it's individualized, it's personalized, it's it's about me as an artist, and it's about the mission that I want to accomplish with this whole project, which is that I want to raise funds to to donate to the organizations that uh, you know support animals and and nature and environment and things, and and so that is not something that is as appropriate then for a traditional publishing avenue. And so this is this is definitely the kind of project then that I, I want to take on for myself rather than trying to you know bring it to a publisher and say, hey do you want to take this on? And another example is you know the Shadowscape Tarot book, like like I said, the, the Major Arcana where I initially because I was brand new at at that point, well, not brand new, but I was sort of, I was a little bit new to the industry, and and I felt like the original sketchbook was very much a, uh, a specialty item. I wasn't sure if the general market would even be interested in reading about, you know, what goes on behind the scenes to create the deck and create the cards and things, and so it, I didn't even think initially to bring it to a publisher. I just thought, well, this is the book that I want to do for, you know, my supporters and for people who want to understand what goes into the making of a deck and what goes on behind the scenes of creating a tarot deck. And so I, I created that as a, a hardcover book that I self-published. And then it was only later that when I realized that it had sold out for several years and I was still getting people requesting and asking for it that I then went to my tarot publisher, which is Llewellyn, and I said, hey, so I have this book and people are asking for it still and I don't have any more left. Do you want to take it on as um, a project that you can publish? And they said, yeah, sure. On average, how long does it take to finish a painting, says Tana? It really, really varies because some paintings are really on the larger side. And, and this painting I'm working on right now isn't even, I wouldn't say it was a large painting. I would say it's a medium-sized one. But in terms of how much detail is involved, this is an extremely detailed and highly time-intensive piece that I am doing. And so this this one has taken, oof, let's see, I started last week. I haven't painted every day on it because I've been working on a couple other little things as well. Uh, I would say that at least 60 hours has gone into this piece so far and it's it's not yet done. On the other hand, I have little paintings sometimes that I do within an hour, so it, it can depend greatly on one, how big the piece is, and two, how much detail there is in it. Do I have any videos that go over my process from concept to completion? Uh, well, Randy, the, especially with the large paintings, it is hard for me to do that because as I said this this has taken 60 hours so it's it's not something I can put into a single or even a series of videos it's just so much so I have many videos where I I show the whole process for smaller pieces more contained ones <laughs> um, but as far as larger paintings like this go the closest I can get to that it, I do uh, more walkthrough write-ups. I have those on my Patreon. 
And those, I give very detailed overview of how, like the entire thought process that goes into a painting and, and what happens with the sketch phase and how I design it and all the, all the little elements that make a finished piece. But as far as in a single video, no, it's, it's just too, too much time. I haven't, I can't, I don't think, I can't think of any reasonable way to accomplish that. Linka Lenika says, how do I get in contact with art directors? I feel it is like a wall you have to climb. Well, especially right now when everyone's sheltering in place and there's no conventions, it is a little bit harder because you can't go to meet them. But in normal times, when we are not all being hermits, it's actually not a hard thing to approach and meet art directors at conventions. So it, I guess it depends on what kind of art you're hoping to create. Uh, you're, cre you're hoping to work with uh, for publishing, I assume. Whether it is for, like for me, I did a lot of games and um, games in the fantasy industry was really where I started and I began that by going to conventions, uh, fantasy conventions and gaming conventions. Gen Con most notably is the biggest one where there are just, there's just a lot of companies and art directors are all there because they are act actively looking for artists to work with. So once, once this COVID stuff is passed, uh, you can look into conventions and there's, there's all kinds. There's conventions for, for licensing. I guess those are more trade shows than conventions. There's, there's those for fine art, you know, like IllixCon where you can find some gallery owners that are wandering the halls. There are game and fantasy conventions where you can find art directors for magazines and publishing companies and gaming companies. And so, yeah, there's, there are many ways to actually reach out and interact with art directors directly that are not too intimidating. What gave me the inspiration for painting a multitude of hummingbirds? <laughs> Marla asks, and I just really like painting hummingbirds. <laughs> and I decided I needed an excuse for that. I, a lot of my paintings uh, have a multitude of something. I don't know if you've noticed that pattern in, in many of my paintings. I, I seem to go for, I seem to have a mentality of, you know, if one's good, let's do a whole bunch of them. <laughs> and I don't know, I, even, even after doing, I don't know, there's like, there's gotta be at least 20 hummingbirds in this piece. I want to do more still. <laughs> I have a couple of ideas for the next paintings now. I've done some thumbnails. Let's see. Oh yeah, Lightbox is another good convention. Well, I haven't been to it yet, but I heard many good things about it because they, they had their first one last year. Uh, so this is a thumbnail for the next one I want to do which is a little bit similar, but it has a, this fiddler is standing on top of this wall and there's going to be this blue door down at the bottom surrounded by brambles and hedges and there's going to be this little hummingbird flying up from it. And this is like a scribbly scribbly thing because I don't even know what the, the real 
composition is, but I just had this idea of kind of this gray monochrome, and then within this little circle, there's this little hummingbird flying out, and it's going to be in full color, and so it's the part of her face that extends into that circle. Yeah, these are, this is how I make notes for myself on stuff to remember what to do for next paintings. Sorry, I'm browsing the comments right now to see what I missed while I was talking just now. Arsina PNG says, I love the color palette you're using for this piece. And yeah, this is, this one is my favorite little hummingbird. Wait, he's off screen there. This little one over here. I like, I like the the purpley tones that go into the tail and the bright green for the chest and a little bit of pink hint in the wings. <laughs> so anyway, no, I have not been to Lightbox. They were, they just had their first year last year. I had not actually even heard about them. I'd been kind of out of the loop. I, I actually miss a lot of conventions these days. I don't really attend as many of them as I used to, mostly because I hate flying places. <laughs> I love them once I'm there. I love being at the conventions, but I hate getting to them. And I hate packing up all my stuff and trying to get everything ready to go to them. So. I guess I, I haven't been doing as many conventions in recent years as I, I used to. But yeah, I was a little bit out of the loop. I didn't hear about Lightbox until everyone was raving about how amazing it was. I would definitely like to check it out. I was planning to drive down to it this year since it's in Southern California, so it's a, it's a drivable trip for me. But I hear they are having an online convention. And from what I heard, I think it is free to register for it and to just check out all the, the online virtual panels and things that they will be offering. And, and it probably is a pretty worthwhile thing to check out. I hope watching me draw all these little feathers is not boring you all to death. <laughs> There's very slow transitions of color as I progress on them. So I don't know if you noticed that I started with some under layers of purple over here to the, to the left side and I've slowly transitioned these to, to bright greens and a little bit of blue. And I'm doing dry brush strokes along the filaments of the feathers. And that gives everything this wonderful feathery texture. And yes, my palettes are tiny. This is called the mini palette. <laughs> it's a palette that I design and that Etcher Lab on Instagram here, they are the ones that produce it these days. But I designed it specifically for my crazy uh, tiny painting and wanting to have all my colors in one place as I do it. Mm -hmm. 
Oh, chat art says that you can't hear me. Can you hear me now? I wasn't saying anything for a second there. <laughs> I was busy trying to figure out what color to do here. So I hit a base wash color first, and I'm just using a cheapy half inch flat for this to quickly spread a pale glaze. Mara Perlia says, I've also wanted you to know that I love the art you made for Bella Sarah. <laughs> Those were fun. Yeah, that was during my, I was kind of towards the end of my game art making phase. Villa Sara was a card game, for those of you not familiar with it, which featured horses. It was, it was kind of a card game that was trying to, uh, they, they were trying to reach an audience of, of young girls because there's a lot of, there were a lot of card games that were targeted at young boys and, and they wanted something that girls would enjoy getting into and wanting to play. So that was that was kind of fun. That was kind of a fun uh, company to work with and to do art for. There was a lot of colorful horses, pegasi, winged things, seahorses. And thanks for answering the questions that I'm not getting to, Marla. <laughs> also, if anyone has questions about any of the tools and things I'm using in this video, I always post it to my RGTV tab after we finish this hour-long session, and I link all the stuff in the description, so you can find it there later if you missed something or didn't write it down and you're curious about what I'm using and my tools. So I paint with lots and lots of layers. I think sometimes people are under the impression that that I can I do this much quicker than than actually happens, or that the layers are you know maybe two or three. But in reality, I would say like ten or twenty layers are not uncommon. And I just I just keep glazing lightly and blending things. And over time, you build up this really rich and complicated color uh, array because it's, it's just made up, it's not just green here, you know, it's like green and purple and blues, and it's all mingled into there across all these layers that I've built up. You know, some that are detailed with dry brush and others that are glazed in like this to help blend out and soften the color edges and the lines. 
Mary Perlia says, what is my current favorite subject to make art of? I think, I, I, I mean, I don't think it ever really shifts away too far from using natural elements. So nature and growth and decay are always a big part of my pieces. And in fact, this piece is for a show. It's, it's upcoming, but it's, it is a ways off. But I like to start working early. It's for my next solo show at Haven Gallery next year. And so, so the reason I start working early is because I frequently don't know what my theme is going to be for a show. And I have to kind of work my way around to it by just doing paintings and seeing what is calling out to me, what pieces want to be explored more in depth, you know, what, what pieces want to have partners and for me to continue seeking out its edges, you know, what, what's the story that it's telling. And so I, I start early because it's a process for me of finding that path. It's not like I, I pick a subject. I don't just pick a subject and say, okay, I'm going to do 15 paintings on this topic. It's more like I start to do the paintings and then as I go, a topic starts to emerge. And, and as it emerges, then, you know, with each successive painting, I get ideas for where to go next with it. And, and so for that, very organic process to work. I have to start well in advance <laughs> so that I, I have a chance for all of those ideas to gel. And, and so this piece I think is going to be for that show. And, and currently I'm playing around with ideas of a garden. But, oh, what was it? I got distracted from your question. You said that you were asking about my favorite subject matter. So yeah, na nature has always been a very strong component of my inspiration in my paintings. Uh, you know, for October, I'm planning to do the whole Undying Tales series again, approaching that. And, and anyone who wants to join me in that is also welcome to do so. But I have all these mythologies and stories and folklore and legends that I have been researching for the past couple of months and I've put them together in this pair up of endangered species and folklore from the regions of the world where these animals come from and so it's a it's a really fun list it's a really fun challenge list you don't have to do all of them because I know doing 31 pieces is a lot for it's a lot for me. <laughs> I, I, I can't imagine doing it if you're not doing art full time. But you know, some people just, just do pick and choose a few animals when they are inspired by the particular story that I have dug up for it. And sometimes people just extend it much longer past the 31 days. But as I said, anyone's welcome to join me for that. And you can find that list of creatures at undyingtales.com. But I'm really excited to start working on that next month. And so I want to get a few more paintings done for my show here that I'm working on that this piece is, is part of, like I was mentioning. And then I could start dig diving into that full time for a whole 31 days. <laughs> so I started it last year and this is going to be the second year of doing that particular project. Shay Arts, uh, your paint question. I don't remember which paint question was that, but uh, you, you, can always, you can always check this out later. I'm going to have it saved into my IGTV, so you can always go back and listen to stuff again afterwards. And if I didn't answer your question, I do these sessions every week at 
6 p.m. Pacific time. So if I missed your question, then feel free to pop back in next week and ask me again. <laughs> Yeah, and if you if you can't find the archive, just just message me later. You can DM me, and I'll I'll point you in the right direction if you need that. But it it should be it'll it'll be here in my archives. And I have about three months worth of other Monday sessions available there too, if you wanted to dig through that and listen to the old ones. So for, for the Instagram, these, these live sessions, I just kind of pull out whatever I happen to be working on that day and, and just start doing it. And for my Patreon, I also have videos there and those are a bit more planned out. Those are more specific subject matter that I have in mind to approach or that people have asked questions about and, and want to see how I do something. So there's just two different kinds of, of videos that I create. Do I use Canson Extra Large Mixed Media Paper for some of my works. I have never used Canson Mixed Media Extra Large Paper. <laughs> so, no, I have not. Uh, do I have a full replay of drawings? I'm so interested by the mix of gold and watercolor. I have various, I do have a lot of videos where I use gold leaf, so I think that's what you're asking. did I miss here? Uh, Hudson Online says my port, my my paint sh I paint sh uh, I paint short strokes. Your wrist is constantly in motion. I've never seen anyone paint like that. Why for glazing? Um, I, I don't know. It's just how I paint. <laughs> uh, do, do you mean for when I'm actually doing the glazing or when I'm doing the dry brush? With the dry brush, I'm doing that because it's it's all about the texture of it. You know, when I'm doing little things like like this, these little strokes because I'm, I'm going for the feather texture on all these individual little feathers in here. And in a way, this is, this is more similar to my botanical painting techniques than I generally do for more of uh, the larger areas of my fantasy style paintings. When will be the show that this piece is featured in? That is, I believe, in April of next year. So yeah, it is, it is a ways off, but as I said, this is kind of something that I, I have to do well in advance just because of the way my brain works in creating series. And, and sometimes I do pieces and, and then once I, I get into the flow of it and I get into the, my theme, I realize, okay, this piece and this piece is not, no longer really fits within the, the framework of that theme any longer. And I, I take them out of the show. But um, at this point, I feel like this one is pretty solid for being in there because I, I like the direction that this is going. And I like the direction that it's taking my brain in, in terms of other pieces that I want to create in this vein. But it will be at Haven Gallery, so you can message info at Haven Gallery. 
ha sorry, info at havenartgallery.com. And again, I will link that in here if you didn't catch that. I'll link it in the archive later. But they are a gallery that I have worked with numerous times now. I've done three, I'm trying to remember. I think, no, I've done, I've done two solo shows with them. Maybe three. <laughs> Memory's not working too well about that right now. Um, and you can always you can always ask Erica to just be put onto the mailing list for new works from me because she keeps a, a running tab on that. Because sometimes I participate in their group sh group shows as well, and then she just sends out to anyone who's interested in in my art. But it's a neat little gallery in Long Island, New York. And I really enjoy working with them. What kind of brush am I using? Spinning Cookies asks. Well, I've got two brushes that I've been using for this. I've been using this Utrecht Red Sable. Utrecht as a brush brand I think is mostly non-existent these days because I think Dick Blick bought them out as a store long ago. But this is just one that I happen to have uh, lying around. And I've also been using these handmade synthetic bristle brush made by Tracy Levinson. And again, I will link that later, but he makes these gorgeous bamboo handled brushes I really like using them because they feel they feel great holding them because they're super lightweight and he has all different kinds of bristle hairs and I actually really like his synthetics so far I have a hard time finding synthetics that I like but I really enjoy those Do I explain process-related techniques? Uh, assuming that's about my Patreon, yes, I do. I do a lot. I talk about what goes on behind the scenes. Uh, sometimes it's technique uh, for you know specific techniques, and other times it is about the whole mental process that goes into creating paintings, creating series. You know the the brain space that I'm in to make art, the inspiration that is behind my work, and uh, just, you know, suggestions for how to cultivate your own inspiration. Yeah, hopefully by April next year, things are open again so that I can go to the opening for the New York show. I, I love going to the gallery so I'll be really disappointed if, if I can't make it to that but crossing my fingers I mean for the sake of, <laughs> of all of us right <laughs> that, that by, by the time April rolls around things are a lot better than they are right now. Do I warm up before I paint? says Randy. Not really. I just kind of dive into them uh, each each morning when I start working on these. Sometimes I like to back up and see where I'm at in a piece because I get so focused on one little small area and especially because I have my, my palette, you know, covering up a lot of stuff, I, I, I forget what the full scope of everything looks like and I have to zoom out every once in a while to make sure that everything is still gelling and that it's all still cohesive and my colors are not just getting too localized. So I need to do that and, and make sure that what's going on here really fits in with everything else here. 
And I, I like right now how this is sort of looking more pale in colors. I was originally going to have it mirror the very deep peacock greens of that side, but thinking maybe to leave it more as this pale, these pale colored feathers on this side. Do I sell technical books or formations? I do, so this is Al, Adel, Adelbert's asking. I have a series of technique books that I wrote. Ooh, the first one was 13 years ago, and then the others followed about every two years. There, there were about four of them, and you might be able to still find them in circulation. They're called Dreamscapes. The publisher went out of business, unfortunately, last year, and so they are out of print, but I believe that they are still probably uh, available at, at bookstores here and there, or you might be able to find used copies. So look for Dreamscapes. But they were, they were a pretty big publisher, so they were out in the world in a lot of bookstores and places. So I, I believe you should probably be able to find some, some copies still out there right now. Adelbert says, I have a heart attack seeing the wet palette over the drawings. <laughs> I'm scared to drop a mess. Well, that's why I have my little tray here. It's to keep the water contained. And the other thing is, you know, the way I work, while I am getting really into the fine detail here, I have spilled water all over a painting, and it, it doesn't really harm the painting. You know, as long as I, I don't mop it up when I'm trying to get the water the liquid off, you know, you just kind of dab. You can, you can spill water on this and for the most part it's not going to be harmed, really. Um, if you spill paint all over it, that's kind of another thing because then it might soak into your paper. But I am not using large enough quantities in what I've got here for that ever to be an issue. And the bigger issue for me then when I'm working like this is that if I have my paint far away and my brush has to keep going back and forth to the water and to the paint, I end up splattering little droplets all across my painting. And for this particular piece, that would actually a worse, be a worse thing to have little speckles of paint going across her face. <laughs> and so by doing this and having the paint right here, I avoid having that happen. So for me, I mean, it might be different for other people, but for me, this was the main concern with, with my um, method of painting and, and my brand of clumsiness, you know, dripping paint all over the place. I had this one painting that I did when I was in, I think I was in high school. And I was, I was super proud of it when I finished. But it's this painting and it has seven moons <laughs> in the sky. And people, when they saw this piece, they would always say, wow, that's so cool that you, you, you have this really sort of fantastic scene with these seven moons and it just gives it this really alien vibe and it, it looks so, fantastical, right? And I always laughed at that when, I mean, inwardly to myself, because the reason I had seven moons on it was because I kept dropping speckles of paint across the page, across my canvas as I was working, and in order to cover up the, the speckles, I just kept adding moons. So I started off with a single moon and I ended up with seven because I was just so sloppy with dripping stuff constantly that that's what I ended up with. Are my Dreamscapes books available on Kindle? I actually didn't know that they were available on Kindle. <laughs> do I stretch my paper? No, I do not. I just tape it down. 
I tape it down and I use fairly thick paper because I am using 300 pound hot press watercolor paper. So between that and the fact that it's taped down, I don't really have any buckling problems. And even when I use 140 pound paper and tape it down and you know, you don't you just don't untape it until you're done with the painting. And I've, I've never had any serious buckling problems with that. And I get really wet with some of my early uh, background layering techniques. So yeah, it's, it's, it's not necessary to have the 300 pound. It, it's a bonus and it will make your paper stay nice and flat even better. But 140 pound has been enough for me in the past. And if you, if you look at some of my past archive videos where I'm doing my ink tech, my ink, um, my Indian ink techniques, you can see how wet I get the page sometimes. And so even with 140 pound, that has been okay for me in the past. I don't know if it's available on Kindle, Marla. I'll have to check that. I guess I never paid attention to my reports from the publisher because <laughs> I didn't realize it was on Kindle. <laughs> I think that we are running down to the end here. It has been over an hour. If anyone has any final questions they want me to address this, this round, if not, if you think of something later or if there's something that I missed and didn't get to, 6 p.m. Pacific time every week on Monday, I am here. And you are welcome to come join me and hang out. But as always, it is a pleasure to have an audience for this. It's kind of given me motivation to paint since some of the downtimes I've had over the past few months. So thank you all. And I'm not going to be posting this finished painting for a while because as I said, it's, it's for, it's, it's probably for that show. But if you're interested in finding out about it when it is done, as I said, you can message info at havenartgallery.com and ask to be put on my mailing list. And you can also pay attention to my stories here on Instagram for the next few days because I will probably have little tidbits of it as I wind down towards the end of this painting. But then it will probably go into hiding for a few months before it is revealed in its final form, which is going to involve also creating a frame, a circular frame for this which I do with my laser cutting. And sometimes I give sneak peeks of these in my Patreon as well. Uh, Adelbert, yes, you can see replays of this. It will be in my IGTV tab later on. It'll, you'll need to give me like 20 minutes after I close up here to post that, but they are all going to be 
well, all, well, I mean all, uh, it's the, the past ones I've done in the past. Um, and I've been doing this for like three months now, I think. So you can catch them, this as well as the other ones, in my IGTV tab. And I will put notes about any of the tools and things that I have used during the course of this. Oh, and the headdress is actually done. Let's see, there she is. <laughs> Mainly what I need to finish now is just the bottom area here and her necklace and the vines here as well. But thank you again, everyone, for joining me. And I hope you have a nice evening or morning wherever in the world you are. It's evening for me. <laughs> Goodbye.